And it is Friday. Welcome to the weekend, holiday weekend at that. We haven't had too many of those already in the calendar year. Good afternoon. Welcome in. We have a lot to do on what we hope will be a fairly entertaining four hours here on the show. Let's get right to it. You ready? Everybody ready to get right to it? Get right to it then. Okay. Why don't we? Uh, is anybody is anybody paying attention? I've just completely lost contact. Oh, oh, I forgot we have a guest waiting. Let's go to him right now, Mike Griffith, joining us. I, I just wanted to make sure we got this shot perfectly. I was waiting for Griff to put the hot dog down. Uh, Griff, you're in a baseball stadium today. This is the opening of the baseball season. We'll talk more about that. But uh, we want to talk to you about uh, something that you wrote the other day, and that involves Kalen DeBoer, the new Alabama mm -hmm. head football coach. Uh, what are your thoughts after 32 days on the job? Well, Paul, we knew that this was going to be an impossible job for anybody to fill the shoes of Nick Saban and and certainly when you bring someone in from the outside that doesn't know a lot about the SEC or the Southeastern Conference, the challenges, I think, go up. Obviously, Greg Byrne, the Alabama athletic director, felt good enough about Coach DeBoer or where he was at in the coaching search after maybe some other names had come up that, that didn't take the job. I don't know if they were offered. They certainly got big raises. Uh, Steve Sarkeesian, over $10 million now. Uh, you know, we saw the Florida State coach on the heels of losing 63 to three. Uh, he gets a Mike Norvell gets a raise over $10 million. Uh, you know, Dan Lanning, very comfortable in Oregon and, and, and Coach DeBoer. But you felt good about that because, after all, Ryan Grubb was a guy that Nick Saban had interviewed, his offensive coordinator. Well, now suddenly uh, Grubb's not there. Grubb's gone to the Seattle. Seahawks and he's also taken the offensive line coach with them and you know one of the things about the Washington team they'd won the Joe Moore award for having the best offensive line so now you don't have your offensive line coach that you thought that maybe coach DeBoer was going to bring you don't have the play caller that coach DeBoer has had to decide for 12 years uh, you did pick up a couple of guys that the off of Butch Jones staff you know Butch Jones is the guy that uh, hired Robert Gillespie and, and Nick Sheridan a couple guys that got promoted so uh, a couple guys from the Butch Jones era at Tennessee now with some Indiana coaches and, and Coach DeBoer. And, and, and here you are with uh, spring football uh, upon us. Yeah, I appreciate that word salad, Mike. But this is exactly what you said in your column. You said it's been a bumpy start for Kalen DeBoer in Tuscaloosa, to say the least. The new Alabama coach has struggled to keep key players and staff members in place, leading many to wonder. If DeBoer can get the tide rolling once again, I see how you 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 kind of skipped that when you were trying to paint a rosy picture. What exactly do you mean by that? Well, listen, here's what I've realized. I mean, this is a very sensitive time for Alabama football fans. They knew this day was it's like an aging relative uh, was ready to pass on or, or pass on or move on, I should say, uh, to ESPN. And boy, I can't wait to see Nick Saban on the set at ESPN. We kind of knew that was coming, but. What I, what I meant, Paul, was that this hasn't gone as smoothly. Uh, this has not been an optimal situation. He's lost key staff members. Uh, elite players have left the program. Their best receiver went to Texas. Their best defensive player went to the Ohio State. Uh, they've had to reach and hire other assistants, typically uh, coaches like Gillespie that get held over. These are usually guys that stick around for a month or two and kind of give a coach the roadmap, and, and then they usually get rid of them. That's typically how it goes when you hold a couple over. I mean, you know, you got to look at the position that Coach DeBoer is in. It's, it's like President Biden. You know, you got to have all these advisors around you telling you what's going on. It's a it's a huge undertaking to be the Alabama football coach in the Southeastern Conference, Paul. I just I think you need to look so, at so the Mike, challenges. So, Mike, hold on. So you're, you're telling me you're comparing Kalen DeBoer to an 80 year old uh, president of the United <laughs> States? I mean, what what does that mean? Well, I wasn't going to go. I'm not going. I mean, Mike, I just want. I don't, I don't. I just. I don't need all these flowery declarative sentences. I just want to know what, exactly what. What is your point? Are you trying to tell us that you don't think DeBoer is going to do it? Well, I think it's been evident from the start that there was going to be some challenges, Paul. I just think we need to be sensitive to the Alabama. Oh, fans. hold on, and Mike. I mean, look at Mike, Mike. Mike, we don't need. Uh, again, I can. I can. I can go to the bookstore if I want to read literature. I just want to know what you really think without all this, without all this nonsensical I BS. Think there's, 
I think Coach Spurrier was right. I think when Steve Spurrier said this was probably going to be a two or three year hire, that that that's probably what this look it's starting to look like it could be with the fact that Coach DeBoer does does not have his best assistance with him any longer. The fact that you know there's been some questions, Paul. I don't know if you saw this. The Seattle Times basically accused Alabama of of holding out on these players so they couldn't transfer. They waited to hire the OC in Seattle, according to Seattle Times, 30-day window so kids couldn't get out of Alabama. It makes you wonder, will that transfer portal be filled up with Alabama players, and what will that do to the Crimson Tide? Listen, Paul, you've seen this just like I have. We were there covering Alabama in the 90s when Gene Stallings went out that door, and he had built a championship program. They were four and seven one year later. Now, I'm not suggesting Bama's going to go four and seven or four or eight, but I think there's a real possibility that they're not going to be a playoff team. And there are a lot of questions about Kalen DeBoer. And if you're not asking those questions, you're not paying attention. Well, listen, I, I was there like you were. Uh, the, you know, Gene Stallings, there, were, there, were, there was a lot of reasons for that. But, you know, we're talking about a coach that was in the national championship game a couple of weeks ago. I mean, this is not some – you know, bum, they, they elevated from the coaching staff to save recruiting like it was back then, if you remember. Uh, this is a guy <laughs> with impeccable credentials. Yeah, well, Bruce Arians was the offensive coordinator, by the way, and he had pretty good credentials. But uh, Michael Penix isn't coming with a newsflash for you, Paul. Uh, the Heisman Trophy runner-up is not on the Alabama football team, and we don't know how Jalen Milrow is going to translate into Coach DeBoer's offense. And here's something that Jamie Chadwell told me. Jamie Chadwell, of course, you, you probably already know, he's our Steve Spurrier Award winner. We're going to honor him next Monday in Gainesville. But something Jamie Chadwell told me was, it's harder to take over a winning program than a losing program. And the reason why is because anytime you try to tell a kid how to do something, you hear, well, that's not the way Coach Saban did it. That's not the way it's always been done before. So there's going to be some challenges. I mean, these players signed on to the Crimson Tide, and Alabama fans will tell you Nick Saban's the greatest coach ever. They signed on to play with him. They didn't sign on to play with this coach that nobody had heard of before the last year or two at 3-3 three and three Fresno State in 2020. I mean, let's be honest. How much did we really know about Kalen DeBoer before last year? He's it's somewhat... Not the hire that you would have expected. I guess it just surprises me knowing that Nick Saban's departure was, was going to be imminent. Now, now, what Nick Saban said, this almost makes me wonder if he's going to come back and coach in a year or two, is he said that in 2020 interview, he said that he would leave when, when he was an impediment to the university. Listen, Paul, he's not an impediment. Nick Saban can still coach. We Mike, saw Mike, Kirby Mike, Smart Mike, can I stop you? I mean, you quit making stuff up, okay? I mean, what Nick Saban what, what, said. What, in, what, what, what Nick Saban said in, in a 2020 interview has absolutely nothing to do with a, a man who said he was tired, he was ready to move on, and he's also 72 <laughs> years old. I mean, I don't know why you always have to just create things out of out of midair. Like, I mean, you, you're insinuating that Alabama. I mean, I, I'm going to interpret what you're saying. You, you, you've already sure. said it to a degree. You basically said Alabama has a two- to three-year coach. Am I, am I right about that? I'm yes or no? That yes, or, yes, or, yes, or, yes or no, Mike? I mean, as of February 17th, uh, yeah, that'd be my prediction is three years would be the window right now. If you put gun to my head, I'd say within three years, yeah. Sure. And, and, and do you think anybody else would be in a different position taking over for, for Nick sure. Saban? Absolutely. I, I think if they I think they could have done a better job and getting the next coach set up, this could have been orchestrated much better, in my opinion. And whose fault, was that, and whose fault is that? Is that Nick Saban's fault well, or is that Kalen DeBoer's mean, fault? I don't think it's either one of their faults. I, I well, think Nick Saban's the guy that, that walked into a room uh, and resigned uh, five weeks ago, and it wasn't anybody else. Well, he, he had quite quit long before then doing weekly television interviews and buying the $17 million mansion and two Mercedes dealerships. If you couldn't see the writing on the wall, I mean, we're not talking about hieroglyphics here. This is a guy that was ready to go, at least for now. Again, and, and, and Paul, I'm a little surprised that you would say that. By the way, the, the guy, the guy that was ready to go, that guy that was ready to go also beat the number one team in the country and prevented Kirby Smart, your guy, uh, from, sure from a three-peat. And that's why I wouldn't be surprised if he's back in two or three years, Paul. I mean, when he's, he's certainly not an impediment to Alabama. Why not? I mean, he looks fit and if it's a fiddle to me. He's going to be on the, the game day show each Saturday. Well, uh, well, Listen, uh, well I'm, I'm Mike, I mean, there, there are guys on game day who are 88, so I'm not sure what correlation that means. What, what does that mean? <laughs> 
I'm just saying I'm not going to sell Nick Saban short. He may get the itch and say, you know so, what? I mean, are, 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 Mike, Mike are you really season. suggesting you think Nick Saban, after a year or two or three on game day, is going to come back to Alabama? Is that what I'm hearing from you? I'm not ruling it out. I'm not ruling it. I'm not selling Nick Saban short, Paul. I'm not going to sell. You may sit there and sell him short. I'm not selling I'm him not. short. I mean, I, I I've, never sold, I've never, never sold him short. Well, I'm glad because this is a guy who's got a lot of football knowledge, that's plenty capable, that's taken very good care of himself. And if after, who knows, maybe Alabama will be ready to have him back after a year. But you wonder, is that where he would want to go if he came back? I don't know. It's a whole other conversation. Yeah. This conversation was about Kalen DeBoer and some of the bumpy travels that he's had so far. There was the speculation over the tampering. Listen, the Arizona coach, quarterback's dad said, that's not true. But the fact that that conversation took place was disappointing to me. Wait, what, the, Mike, the, the just, just for those of us uh, who, who aren't as smart as you and your, your whatever you're suggesting, what, what exactly are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about Arizona having an extremely uh, talented quarterback that was a freshman. You may have noticed he won the offensive freshman of the year with will be honored at the Spurrier Award next Monday night. You knew this. Uh, but, but the father had said that there'd be some schools that, that you know, through the back channels. And, and some people put this together and, and made Alabama an allegation. And the dad said, no, it wasn't Kalen DeBoer in Alabama. You know, but the fact that we're even having a conversation, listen, Alabama's got Jalen Milrow, and they brought the quarterback with them uh, from Washington as well. I mean, th these are the sorts of things. These are the sorts of sidebars. Uh, that I think could be a distraction for this program. And this is a really important time for the Tide to stay on track. And I don't mind telling you uh, about what's happened in Tuscaloosa with the offensive coordinator leaving and the line coach leaving and Coach DeBoer hiring the guys from Butch Jones' uh, era at Tennessee and, and the five Indiana coaches. Everybody knows that. Of course there's going to be some drop-off from Nick Saban. And it's going to be a tough league next year. Mike, before you go, uh, how is uh, everyone? You, you're, you're, you cover Georgia. You, let's start with Georgia. How are how are how is Georgia reacting to all this and and some of the other key players in in and really in the SEC, especially from a recruiting standpoint? Well, Paul, Georgia's got their challenges too. I mean, their run defense fell all the way to number eighteen in the country, and so good thing for them. Six of their seven defensive tackles are coming back, and a pretty talented group, you know, Carson Beck. Now he's got some receivers. I think they'll be more effective driving down the field, certainly uh, off the field. He'll be driving a little bit better in a Lamborghini these days. If that gives you an idea, Georgia doing well with their collective and taking care of their players competitively with other programs that have elite quarterbacks, but uh, Georgia doesn't think too much. Kirby doesn't think too much about Alabama. Georgia fans really, you know, the, really the October 19th game at Texas is, is the big headache. Uh, there's an F1 race that weekend. Georgia fans having tickets get having a hard time getting tickets for that game. They're looking at that as probably the game that's going to decide the SEC in Texas next year. And, and and to me, that that's what I've heard more about is the game in Austin. Griff, you, Texas are, are you? Are, do I need to remind you that that before that game in in Austin, the dogs have a game in Tuscaloosa on September 28th? Oh, I'm I'm very well aware. Listen, I'm with you. I think that's a game that should be a focal point. But you know, what you're asking me what I'm hearing and. Okay. I'm hearing a lot about Texas and the threat of Texas and Steve Sarkeesian. I mean, that's a staff that's been in place. That's a team that beat Alabama by 10 points in Tuscaloosa last year. Uh, that's an impressive program that Steve Sarkeesian's built. And, and they're a real threat to the SEC with their, with their budget. So I, and I, to me, I think that's the big threat right now. People talk about Texas and Georgia at the top of the SEC. And then you, you get into the second tiers, the Alabamas, the Tennessee, the LSUs. Old misses in Missouri's. Mike Griffith joining us. Thank you, Mike. Always good to see you. Appreciate it. Mike Griffith joining us from at Athens, Georgia. <laughs>